Reaction mechanisms are important because if you are going on to organic, you will need to know about them. They'll look a little different there, but the concept will be the same. All right, so reaction mechanism has to do with the series of individual chemical steps where you get an overall chemical reaction. Where have we seen this kind of thing before? Yeah. Nobody? Hess's Law? Remember that? Maybe a little bit? All right, what's well, coming back? All right, so in the reaction mechanism, you're going to have a series of what are called elementary steps. An elementary step is a reaction which we will express as an equation that cannot be broken down into any more simpler steps. All of our elementary steps must add up to the overall reaction. So remember, think back to Hess's law. You may have to turn some around, some may be backwards, you may be canceling stuff out on the left and the right as you add them up. Now, what the, the reaction mechanism within the reaction, you may have something that's called a reaction intermediate. This is going to be some sort of compound that forms in one elementary step and then is consumed in another. So it's part of the mechanism, but it doesn't show in your final equation. But it's, it's part of the process to get there. So it's not going to show in your overall equation. Everybody has a blank? Okay, turn the page. So how in the world do we do rate loss for elementary steps? Because this is a chapter about rates. So, the number of reactant particles that are involved in the elementary step is called the molecularity. Molecularity. Who remembers finding zeros for like polynomial equations and talking about like multiplicity kind of thing, how big the bounce is? It's kind of like that. Not exactly, but it's kind of like that. Okay, so the most common molecularities are one, we call that unimolecular, and two, we call that bimolecular. Um, it's actually not tri, it, it is, it, it's close, but it's called termolecular. Remember, I didn't come up with these names. I, I like to be logical. I just have to tell you what doesn't always make sense. So, one and two are the most common. Three is possible, but it is very, very rare. So, this is kind of how you get reaction order as a series of elementary steps. So, unlike the overall chemical equation, it is possible to deduce, so that means you can figure it out, deductive reasoning, not inductive logic, a rate law for an elementary step because there are no intermediate species. So if you have an elementary step that goes substance A to product, there is only one substance so that is involved in the elementary step, because remember, we're only counting the reactants here, only the left side. So there's only one on the left. Its molecularity is one. These are generally going to be like a decomposition reaction kind of thing. So the rate is rate constant times the initial concentration. If you have two of the same reactant. So here we've got a combination. So if you had like oxygen plus oxygen making O2, that would be an example there. 
So you have two of two reactant particles. So the molecularity is two. Since they are the same, they're both A, the rate, rate constant A squared. If you have two different reactants, still two, because we can count, we can count to three. If you can count to three, you can do this. So rate, concentration of one times the concentration of another. What? This is not hard. This is not hard. Now, these are our termolecular ones. They're examples, but they are very rare. So if you have three of the same, so that would be like O plus O plus O making ozone, O3, would be concentration, singular oxygen cubed. Again, one, two, three, two are the same, that squared. Anybody confused? Who thinks this is, uh, yes? Okay. Oh, up here? It says deduce. It's a good question. Fair enough. Now, in most of the mechanisms, one of the elementary steps involved is going to be much slower than the others. So, for example, if we have a reaction has two elementary steps, like the rate of the first one will be much, much less than the rate constant of the second one. So the slowest one is called the rate determining, which is not how I learned it. I learned it as the rate limiting step. So think about it, you are the weakest link. So the weakest link in the chain, the slowest, it's like a relay. Now. So the rate law that is actually the one for the rate determining step is going to end up being your predicted rate law for your overall reaction because that's the one that's the slowest. So if you're looking at an energy diagram here, reactions going across, if you see, we have two different transition states here. So two peaks tells us we have two elementary steps. This one here, the activation energy is higher. So you've got two reactions, elementary steps to get from your original reactants to your final products. So what can we note from this graph we can note that so this is one so we'll call this step one and this is step two so this is step one this is step two if you want to put a one and a two you can label them so we can say we can look at this graph and we can say step one has a higher activation energy because the graph is higher We can also determine, because it has the higher activation energy, step one is going to have um, a lower or smaller um, rate constant, because those were kind of the calculations we did yesterday, calculating the rate constant regarding activation energy. The higher the activation energy, the lower the rate constant. And so we can say because this has a higher activation energy, it has the lower rate constant. So we're going to say step one is actually going to be the one that determines the overall rate. generally because of these activation energies. So this one happens slowly, this one happens very quickly.
Question. All right, let's turn the page. All right, this is a throwback to Hess's Law. Okay. So in order to have a valid reaction mechanism, the elementary steps in the mechanism have to add up, so they have to sum to the overall reaction. And the rate law that is predicted by your proposed mechanism is consistent with what is experimentally observed. Because remember I told you that the order of the reaction can only be determined experimentally. Here we can predict it, and as long as it's consistent, we're probably on the right track. Now, this is like the saving grace for me in organic chemistry. A reaction may have more than one valid mechanism. So it is not actual, actually possible to prove that one singular one is correct. My organic two professor hated me for drawing out like seven step mechanisms because that, those were the reactions that I remembered. I was like, I got there eventually. He's like, all you really had to do were these two. I was like, I couldn't remember those. So I took the long way around. Now, so let's look at this one here. If we have this reaction here, based on multiplicity and such, we would expect our rate law to be rate equals rate constant K times the concentration of our first reactant times the concentration of our second one. Because that's what it tells us that's where we start. But it's not. That is not consistent with what we observe experimentally. So we can consider a two-step mechanism. You're not going to have to be proposing these on the test, okay? This is for demonstrative purposes only. You may be having to deal with this kind of stuff, but you will not have to be generating equations from scratch in this class. So let's say first we can have nitrogen dioxide and nitrogen dioxide making nitrogen trioxide and nitrogen monoxide and that elementary step goes slow. So the rate for that, since we have the same two, it has a multiplicity of two. So make sure you differentiate the rate constant for which reaction step that you're on. That will be important later. Since these are the same, it's squared. And then we can take our NO3, combine it with the carbon monoxide, and get our final product and say that one goes fast. And that one would be consistent with our expected rate law. Now, I didn't actually give you these rate constants. Sometimes they'll be given, sometimes they won't. Ultimately, you find the one that's the slowest. So which one's the slowest? The first one or the second one? The first one. So the first step is our actual rate determining or rate limiting step. So that means our predicted rate or rate law for our overall reaction is the same as the slowest one. So that would be K1 concentration NO2 squared, which actually matches what we see when we do this in the lab. 
Now, let's look at this here because <coughs> do you see we have NO3 on both sides, but it doesn't show up in your final equation? <laughs> Uh, this is NO2. The next one is NO3. But it doesn't matter because it's the fast one. But NO3 occurs here in both, so it cancels out. That would be an example of a reaction intermediate. So it's there, but you don't actually see it. So there are a couple of these we're going to go through. If we have a mechanism where the initial step is fast. If the initial step is fast compared to the other steps, usually we're going to do these with two. If you get three or more, it really starts to get complicated. So if the initial step is fast, it is not the rate determining one. The rate determining is the slow one. That means another one that occurs later on in the mechanism is going to be your rate determining step. All right, now here's where we're going to start getting into things where labeling is important. A fast first step is going to reach equilibrium which is what we're going to start talking about in the next chapter, hopefully later today. At equilibrium, the rate of the forward reaction equals the rate of the reverse reaction. So a preview of coming attractions. When we go from reactants to products, we're in the first step, so that's our rate constant of our first step. At equilibrium, the reverse reaction has the same rate constant, but we're going the other direction, so it's an inverse. That's where people are going to go. I don't like this very much. I understand. So, let's kind of look at these here. If we have this equation here, they're giving us a mechanism. So this is our first step, it is fast. So here's our first step, here's our second, here's our third. Note the subscripts of the reactions. So because this one goes fast and the one after it goes slow, this one has time to start going in reverse. More to come shortly. So we can cancel out some stuff <coughs> All right, so there's our nitrogen. Here's our dinitrogen dioxide. Um, can we cancel out some more stuff? Yep. H2, that's still on the left, and it needs to be up there. 2NO, 2H2. Oh, that's going fast, so... That'll. So we have H2O, H2O into into O. There we go. All right. Ultimately, it's going to cancel. I think that might have been supposed to be an N2O. Ultimately, they're all going to cancel out. This is the one we care about. The slowest one is the rate limiting one. So our rate for our overall reaction is this one, K2 times the concentration of H2 times the concentration of N2O2. So the first step is not the rate limiting one, one on down the line is. Find the slowest one and write your rate law from there. So here, even though our reaction has intermediates, 
our overall rate law does not contain an intermediate. They will be given. Um, they, they will be given. However, you can use the mechanism to calculate the overall rate constant for the reaction, which is what we're about to do. It's a good question. All right, everybody got the blanks filled in? Let's turn the page. So... We try it again because our rate law doesn't have the intermediate. So we can rearrange it using the first step at equilibrium. So we'll have to kind of flip back and forth. But our first step at equilibrium is this one. So we have was that two you know plus um, goes forward and backwards to get into O2 so we can, let's write a rate law for this even though so we know that would be rate equals K1 times the concentration of NO, and since this is a two, it would be squared. Because that means the same thing as NO plus NO. If you prefer to write it that way, do it. We also know that the rate of this reaction, because it's at equilibrium, this is where you're not going to like it, also equals this rate constant, so of the reverse reaction, times the concentration of N2O2. The odds of me putting this on the test, very slim. But we'll be on the homework. Okay, so now let's take this and let's get into O2 by itself because since this is the rate limiting step, it might need to be in there somewhere. All right, so all we need to do is divide by inverse K So it's just a lot of substituting. You can do this. So we know that N2O2 is going to equal K of the forward reaction, NO squared, divided by rate constant of the backwards reaction. All we did was substitute and rearrange. Are we okay? All right. So now let's substitute that in our rate equation because our rate equation here had into O2. Into O2 does not show up here. So we can't have a rate law that has an intermediate that doesn't show up in the original equation. So this is how we're getting rid of it. So right now we have rate equals, we're gonna, we're gonna rewrite this, K2 and H2, make sure I write this right. Is it H2? 
and then um, N2O2. Is that what it said? Yeah, K2, N2O2. Now, where we have N2O2, we're going to put this. So we're just going to substitute it. So that means our rate is now going to equal K2, H2. I'm going to rearrange it and make it look pretty in a second, but I'm just going to substitute it in right now. And then instead of into O2, I'm going to put K1 concentration of NO squared divided by K negative 1. There's a whole lot of Ks in there, right? Yeah. Yeah, it's kind of nasty. So let's just kind of bring them all to the front. So I'm going to come down here and write it. So our rate equals... K2, K1, K inverse, concentration H2, NO squared. Now here's the good news. All these Ks, we're going to combine all of our individual Ks. into one overall K. Notice this does not have any subscript. So you could do this numerically if you really wanted to. So our rate is going to be our consolidated rate constant. Concentration H2, concentration NO squared. Now, this corresponds to reactants in our original equation, so it's good. If your slowest step contains an intermediate, you have to find a way to substitute. So let's try this. All right. So we have... Ozone decomposing to oxygen gas and our experimental rate law is K ozone squared oxygen O to the negative one. That's interesting. How in the world can we do that? All right, so this is our first one because it has K1. This is the second one because it has K2. So, we know that if we put these around, we're going to have, I'm just going to put them under each other, plus O goes to 2O2. So, oxygen goes away, We add these, so we have two ozones, and ultimately we end up with three oxygens. That's the first part. We're just lining them up and canceling them. So that's good. That's the easy part. It's kind of like Hess's Law. Then you have to deal with the rate constants and rate laws. That's the not-so-fun part. All right. So we know that we can do this. We know this one is fast. We know this one is slow. So according to our slowest step here, our rate should be K1. <coughs> nope, not this one, right? K2, because it's the slowest one. Concentration, O3, concentration, oxygen. But we don't have oxygen in our original equation. So this can't be valid. This is not an okay rate law for our overall reaction. So let's 
write our equilibrium rate laws for our first reaction. So the first one, we know that our rate equals first forward rate constant, concentration of ozone. This is K2 or K3? This is K1, this is O3. K2. We, don't, we won't have a K3 because we don't have three steps. From the, the second step in the mechanism. In the proposed one. Yes. Yeah. Because when we're writing rate laws and elementary steps, we use the reactant. But the single oxygens go away because it occurs on both sides. So our overall rate law can't have an intermediate. So going back to our fast step, which is at equilibrium, the forward reaction K1 concentration of O3 also equals K inverse, K of the backwards reaction, O2 times oxygen. Everybody with me there? We're just going left and right. Now we want to get rid of oxygen. So let's isolate oxygen. So let's divide by inverse K and O2. So concentration of oxygen is going to equal K of the forward, O3. Nothing changing there. Then we're just dividing K inverse concentration of O2. Everybody with me? There's not really numbers involved. All we're doing is moving things around. Kind of like trig. Now this here, we're going to plug in right there. So I'm going to write it ugly first. So I don't forget. If you want to write it pretty first, excellent. Did we get it substituted in now? All right, let's start to clean it up. So I'm gonna bring the case to the front, K2, K1, K inverse. Now here, I have O3 and I have two of them, so I'm going to make that square. And then I still have oxygen in the bottom. Generally, we like to write our rate laws in a single line. So since this is what it's asking us to find, combine all the Ks into one overall reaction. Ozone squared, and here we'll represent oxygen in the denominator as the negative one. So it's kind of like a proof. It is a proof, actually. So we have now proved that that is correct. It's just rearranging and substituting. Will you have to do this with numbers? Highly unlikely. In this class. All right. Yes. Yeah.